All right, I'm going to get you started. Uh, you're in the seminar that's titled Contracts, Insurance, and Risk Management. Oh, my. What can you do to protect yourself, your farm, and your pigs from disasters? And obviously, in particular light, potentially, of foreign animal disease considerations, um, but, but many other things to be aware of between contractual relationships as a grower or as a pig owner or those that seeking to get into the industry. So we've gathered some pretty good experts together. My hat's off to the Iowa Pork Producers and the Producer Aid Committee to, to kind of direct this topic. I think it's really pertinent in, in the uh, industry setting we sit at here in Iowa and moving forward with sometimes you never know what the next disaster is, right? Whether it's a physical issue, whether it's a political uh, consideration that affects our markets, um, or, or whether it's just a, even internal family uh, situations that arise. And you know, Several years ago in the 90s, we had a disease called the mystery swine disease, right? It was a mystery. We had no idea what it was. And I always keep thinking, what's the next mystery disease? It took us, we had several names for PERS before we identified what it was. But what could be our next uh, challenge? And hopefully it's not, Lord willing, a disease. And, and God willing, it's not foreign animal disease that comes onto the shores of the U.S. But that potential is there. And, um, and, and it's a reality. Um, so hopefully, hopefully uh, we, we avoid. Uh, that coming to the U.S., but let's uh, let's take what precautions we can to be prepared. So, in light of that, our experts today we've gathered. I'm Colin Johnson with Iowa State University Extension. I'll be chairing and moderating the session. Well, we have an attorney, we have an insurance uh, representative, and then we have somebody that works more in risk management with with the field of economics. So I think it's a a good background for you. And so I'm going to allow each of our presenters to kind of give about 10 uh, minutes or so of their involvement with the industry on this issue and their expertise, and we'll have uh, half of our session for Q&A time. So, and our first presenter, uh, Matt Berger, is a chair of uh, Gislason and Hunter LLP Agricultural Law Group. Uh, Matt recognizes the importance that farmers, agricultural business, community banks, and other small businesses play in supporting and sustaining rural communities. And Matt's had a, a wide diversity of, of issues that he's worked through in, in representing uh, not just pork producers and agriculture entities, but other business entities on, uh, on, a, on a wide array of issues and the role of government's involvement in, in regulatory things acquisition, finance, and, and so forth. So I'll let him give his background with his company and, uh, and go from there. And then I'll just allow Marty to step up following that. Marty Pippett is an independent insurance agent for Lamar's, a native of Lamar's, uh, um, in here is employed with Mark Crop Insurance, where he's a producing agent and the director of sales for Mark Crop Insurance. Marty's specialization is agribusiness insurance, farm insurance, and crop insurance. And uh, in his desire and, and uh, passion for the industry has also been recently uh, exhibited by the fact that he is developing the ASF uh, implementation of an insurance policy coverage that uh, we'll talk about here shortly. Um, and then Christopher Putins. Chris is a PhD student in economics at Iowa State University. Chris is a native of Carroll County, livestock background with uh, cattle feeding over there uh, that his family's run. So, but he's a research assistant for Dr. Lee Schultz. So, um, getting really deep into livestock economics on behalf of Iowa State University. So, he's going to talk about some of the risk management uh, finance uh, potential that sits out there and how to protect yourself a little bit. So, our first presenter, though, I'll bring up Matt Berger. Thank you. Again, my name is Matt Berger. I'm an attorney with uh, Gisselson and Hunter. Uh, and as Colin mentioned, uh, I uh, represent a number of uh, farmers, particularly pork producers, uh, and uh, cover the gamut, uh, basically, except for estate planning. I uh, really don't do that. I uh, have one of my partners do that. Uh, I'm based out of southern Minnesota, but uh, practice both in Minnesota and in Iowa. Uh, and uh, work with producers uh, in both states and uh, other states on uh, all of their legal needs, uh, both uh, transactional, contracts, regulatory, uh, and when necessary, uh, litigation and fighting in court. Uh, in preparing this presentation and thinking about the topic, uh, I start from a premise that uh, in, my, in my experience working with farmers, Every farm and every farmer is different. So nobody can stand up here and give you a one-size-fits-all uh, disaster plan that uh, you can take home and stick on the shelf and say, here's my plan and I don't need to think about that anymore. Uh, something happens, I have that sitting there and everything will be fine. Uh, instead, 
what, what I've put together and what, what I've, th I've thought about and encourage each of you to think about is taking the steps to go through this uh, exercise in advance to think about your particular farm, your particular operation, uh, everything that goes into that, uh, so that when something happens and you're in that stressful environment, uh, you've thought about it, you, you have your uh, information together and uh, can act. Uh, I, I've represented a number of farmers with a, uh, going through a variety of disasters, uh, everything from uh, fires and uh, roof collapses due to weather, uh, disease outbreaks, um, activist involvement, um, and uh, anything else that can come up. Uh, and uh, I've seen a very distinct difference in how those have gone for producers of those who have taken the time ahead of time to uh, think about these things and uh, those who uh, have not put in that time in advance. And uh, it, it's, uh, in my experience, very much worth the time. Uh, so as you go through this, the steps that I recommend, and I'm going to touch on some of these and then some of the other presenters will fill in as well, uh, but uh, there's five basic things you need to go through. One is identifying what the risks are, uh, and then uh, there's a series of things you need to review uh, to determine how uh, those things will be affected by the risks that you've identified. And that's your contracts, your uh, ongoing business relationships, uh, your uh, regulatory requirements or your uh, relationship with uh, government agencies, uh, your insurance coverage uh, are, are the big three categories. Once you've done all that, um, you should take that uh, information you've thought about and put together a written plan so that you have it ready. Uh, and most importantly, this isn't something you can think about one time. Uh, it, it's something that periodically you need to bring back up uh, think about uh, and uh, review as your operations has changed, uh, as the uh, broader world has changed, uh, so it's up to date when you need it. Uh, so beginning with the first step, identifying your potential risks, uh, there's two types of things that are two pots that I would put these into. One is internal threats. Uh, there are things that can go wrong in your operation that have nothing to do with anybody on the outside or anything on the outside. Uh, you can have e equipment fail. Uh, I've seen uh, several cases in, in hog barns where the, um, the temperature controls or the curtain controls uh, fail uh, and uh, the, if not addressed can uh, cause a pig loss. Uh, you can have uh, manure leaks from your manure storage and uh, have to deal with that. Uh, or one extreme example I had, uh, a client actually had their own grain elevator and had a dust explosion. Uh, thankfully, uh, nobody was hurt, but it was a uh, very intense and very uh, scary incident that uh, occurred in the middle of winter when the temperatures were uh, uh, 10 to 15 degrees below zero, and they had to respond to all of this. Uh, but identifying those parts of your farm that are at risk, uh, what, what could happen uh, that would cause a, a disruption to your operation. Uh, you, you need to go through and think about what the parts of your farm are uh, that could fail and identify what those risks are. Uh, the second is external threats. These are things that can happen to you or to your farm, um, and I think many of these are pretty straightforward and things that we all generally know about if we take the time to think. Uh, fire, uh, weather, uh, and disease uh, being the big ones. Uh, but the, the key, again, is thinking about all of those things that can go wrong. Uh, it's uh, like my, the, the partner that uh, does a estate planning tells me, um, nobody likes to think about their death, but you need to. Uh, farmers don't like to think about these disasters, uh, but you need to. Uh, once you've identified what those risks are, uh, the, the next step of that is thinking about what will, what will it mean if that happens? Uh, what will I need to address? How will my operation be disrupted? Uh, what do I need to think about? Uh, I don't know if uh, many people followed or participated in the uh, recent uh, um, foreign animal disease uh, exercise that uh, uh, the federal and several of the state uh, governments did with African swine fever. Uh, I participated up in Minnesota with that. 
and I know one of the things that uh, was one of the biggest topics there was what are we going to do with all these uh, dead animals? How are we going to dispose of them? Uh, and that comes up with fires and uh, uh, many other things as well. Uh, you need to think about that ahead of time and have a plan for that. Uh, you may have surviving pigs um, with, with either a disease outbreak or a, a fire or barn collapse. Uh, I'm going through a case right now with a hog producer who had a roof collapse uh, at a sow facility uh, and uh, the, the pigs were all fine, uh, but their barn was unusable. And so they had to figure out, what am I going to do with all of these animals to make sure that they're properly cared for um, while I uh, sort out the issue with the building? Uh, if you lose pigs, uh, how are you going to get new ones? Um, if there's a feed issue, uh, how are you going to get that if you have your own grain elevator and that explodes? Uh, and how are you going to clean up uh, if there's debris or damage to buildings? <clears throat> so you want to think about, okay, if I have a fire, these are all the things that can happen. If I have a roof collapse, these are all the things that can happen. These are the issues I'm going to have to deal with and uh, have that bullet point list ahead of time. Uh, once you've identified those risks and how the risks uh, may disrupt your operation, uh, you need to think about preserving the business and uh, moving forward your farming business. And one critical aspect of that is figuring out what obligations uh, you have uh, going on. I, I tell a lot of producers that uh, when you're going through a disaster and your business has been disrupted, uh, you, know, you need to think about the long-term viability of your, your business. And in that situation, uh, cash can be king. You, you need to think about your cash flow. Uh, what are my ongoing obligations going to be? And what income am I going to have going forward in that? And make sure that uh, those things work out. And if there's a deficit, figure out what your savings or equity or financing options are uh, to get through that period of time. Uh, so on the liability side, this, this is why you review your contracts. Because you need to understand, uh, if I have a disruption and, and I lose my barn, what commitments have I already made that I'm going to have to pay um, regardless of what happens to my farm? So uh, that can include uh, inputs. If you have feed contracts that you've entered into to get feed on an ongoing basis, uh, you need to know what those obligations are. Uh, on the flip side, if you're selling pigs, uh, you need to know what your contractual commitments are to sell pigs. Uh, do you have a contract that says, uh, you just sell the pigs you have when they're ready? Or do you have a contract that says you will deliver uh, a certain number of pigs on a regular schedule? Uh, you need to understand what your commitments are there. Uh, you need to understand for each of those contracts, how long do they last? How long am I obligated to do this? Uh, is it a month-to-month -month contract that you can get out of? Or is it a, a three- to five-year contract that will have ongoing commitments? Uh, those differences can be key in figuring out uh, the cash flow to get through the lean times. Tied to that is uh, if you have a long-term contract, can you get out of it? Some contracts have provisions that will say this contract lasts for five years uh, but can be ended early uh, if certain things happen. Uh, so you need to look at those contracts and say, if I need to get out of this early, how do I do that? Is it you have to give some written notice in advance? Or is it something that will automatically happen if certain conditions happen? Uh, every contract is different, but you need to review your contracts to understand that. You need to understand in your contracts how do they allocate risk uh, between the two parties. Uh, one common thing, uh, particularly with uh, um, that I see in uh, contracts for the sale of pigs, would be uh, if you have a situation that's disrupting your pig flow, not completely uh, ending all of your pigs, but saying um, you may have half the number of pigs available. Uh, are you required to split those between different uh, purchasers, or can you decide where those go and which contracts you can get out of? Uh, you need to be aware of that. Uh, and that ties into then the, the last point, uh, how do all of your different contracts relate to each other? 
Uh, you, you need to make sure that uh, the, when you're in a situation like this, that your obligations to one uh, contract partner uh, won't put you in violation with uh, the obligations to a different contract partner. One particular type of clause to pay attention to is uh, a force majeure clause, and uh, that's uh, one of those uh, uh, fancy Latin words that they uh, teach you in law school that uh, uh, could be explained a lot more clearly, but uh, for some reason they call them these. Um, but basically what these provisions are are provisions that are common and ongoing contracts that say if there is some event occurs that is completely unexpected, uh, an act of God, something that uh, nobody's controlling, nobody's at fault for, it just happens, um, those events can excuse performance. So you need to pay attention to those provisions if they're in your contract because the extent to which your performance will be excused or the extent to which your contract partner's performance may be excused uh, varies from contract to contract and really depends on the words actually used in that contract. Um, and, and I emphasize this uh, now uh, because uh, many clients that I work with when they're negotiating contracts uh, for their farm, uh, they're not thinking about disasters or, or the bad things that can happen when they're negotiating. You're thinking about the term, you're thinking about the price, you're thinking about the direct business aspects of those contracts. And a lot of times I see these provisions are part of the boilerplate language that one side or the other's lawyer puts in there and nobody really pays attention to them until the contract is signed and some disaster happens and everyone is going back after the fact and says, well, what does this mean now? Um, and that's not uh, the way to protect yourself. Uh, so when you're negotiating contracts, you want to be thinking about these and paying attention in particular uh, to these contract terms uh, to make sure that uh, you're protected um, or at least you know how much you are protected and what your risks are. Uh, again, there are some common force majeure events um, that are covered, uh, but this really depends, again, on the language of the contract. I can't emphasize that enough. Uh, the contract will list the events that would be covered. Uh, so you want to review that list um, and see how many of these uh, are on there. Um, I, I've identified the most common ones. Um, for hog producers, I'd say the, the, the key ones to think about are uh, fires and explosions, uh, weather events, um, disease, and uh, the government actions or government regulations. Those are the ones that I see coming up most often. Uh, impossibility, uh, I, I mentioned this, uh, even without a force majeure clause, uh, there is a defense at law that can apply uh, if performance becomes impossible. Uh, I'm mentioning this briefly uh, because I'll say if you're at the point of having to resort to uh, this defense in a court case, you're already in trouble. Um, this isn't something you can prepare ahead of time and this is kind of the last ditch uh, if nothing else works uh, defense that uh, you can try. Uh, you don't want to be relying on this. Once you've gone through the contracts, uh, insurance is going to be a key thing. Uh, we have uh, uh, Marty who's going to talk about that. I want to briefly skip ahead in how I would normally present this and touch on the regulatory reporting. Uh, because this is something that uh, um, I've seen firsthand nobody thinks about ahead of time. Uh, but there are uh, federal laws uh, on the books that uh, require if hazardous substances are uh, released, uh, regardless of how or why they're released, uh, reports are required to be made to the federal government. They have a call center out in, uh, I believe it's Maryland, uh, that you're required to call. Uh, but also to state and local emergency response officials. Uh, and just to kind of emphasize how this can play out, uh, I represented a, a client who supplied ag inputs, uh, and one night a, a couple of uh, guys uh, decided that they would uh, come to his facility with some jerry-rigged uh, fire extinguisher canisters and uh, try to steal some anhydrous ammonia so that they could go out and uh, make some methamphetamine. Uh, 
Uh, well, this went about as you would expect it to go. Uh, and the guy shows up the next morning and thankfully didn't see any bodies, but he saw these canisters laying on the ground and the uh, tanks of anhydrous ammonia sitting there empty. Uh, and this guy did what, in my opinion, uh, everybody exercising common sense would do. He called the local sheriff and said, somebody tried to steal this from me and it's been released. And the sheriff came out with the hazmat gear and they contained the scene and did everything properly. Uh, but what this guy didn't do is think, you know what, there's been a release of anhydrous ammonia. Um, to hell with the local sheriff, <laughs> excuse the language. I need to call the federal government out in Maryland. Uh, that, that's what I need to do immediately. Uh, well, the, the EPA came, came in and said, you delayed four hours in calling us and notifying of the, us of this release, and they imposed a $50,000 penalty on him because he was four hours late in calling the federal government, even though nothing would have changed with the response. Um, so that's why I emphasize this, is it, it's uh, ridiculous and offends common sense of uh, most people who are in business, but it's a risk that you need to be aware of. And it's something that if you don't know about and think about ahead of time, you're going to miss, and it can have a major consequence after the fact. So when you have your written plan, uh, you need to have that. If uh, there's been a release of something uh, that may be a hazardous substance, have the list of phone numbers there and have somebody designated. Um, you know, this person's taking the lead on the response. This person's going to be making those calls. Um, also review your permits and insurance policies to make sure you're uh, reporting on those. Uh, but uh, th these are things that, uh, again, when you're in the heat of the moment, uh, nobody's going to be thinking about. Um, but that's why you need to plan ahead of time and be prepared. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Marty on the insurance piece. Good morning, everyone. Uh, first off, I'd like to say it's nice to see so many young faces here. Uh, it's great to see the youth involved in the industry. And uh, also, I'd like to commend everyone for coming and uh, being brave to sit through a meeting with uh, an attorney and an, and an insurance guy. So this will be riveting for you guys. But um, as, as uh, Colin had said, my name is Marty Pippett. I work with Mark Crop Insurance. Uh, we're in Northwest Iowa. We deal exclusively with the farm community. Uh, we specialize in farm insurance and crop insurance. And uh, as we'll discuss here in a little bit, uh, foreign animal disease coverage as well. So, um, <clears throat> insurance is a very broad topic with a lot of complexities. And the most profound thing that I can take or have you guys take away from today is that you need to talk to your agent. And I hope that your agent and you have a good relationship, that you're comfortable in talking through the details. A lot of what Matt discussed here was being proactive in your risk management strategies. Some of those risk management strategies strategies for you guys are things that you can do on the farm and uh, some of those things are involving contracts and then of course we'll get into the insurance piece. So with insurance being as broad as it is, we're going to take and narrow that down and just talk about some swine specific type of coverages. Um, as I said before and I really want to emphasize this, talk to your agent about the policy that you have and the coverages that it provides. The coverages that we're going to talk about will vary from company to company with the exact same you know, main language. The fine print can vary from company to company. <clears throat> so a few uh, very important swine specific coverages, would, one would be care custody control. So if you're a custom feeder, this is an endorsement you're going to want to add to your farm policy. That will provide you coverage in the suffocation type instance that you may be negligent. Uh, in the death of those hogs. Your integrator is going to be insuring those hogs in the event of a tornado or a fire and uh, nothing that was a result of your negligence. But if you have a mishap, this is what would respond to that. One thing you're going to want to make sure of is when you're looking at your policy, don't be confused with an endorsement that might be on there that says custom feeding. Custom feeding is a line item charge. 50 bucks, $75, and that is just to take into account that you've got more folks on the farm. You've got you know, your vets there, your feed delivery, you've got more people on there, so there's a larger exposure for the company. 
that is not providing you the care custody control coverage. And there's, uh, there's been several cases and precedent throughout the years um, where uh, agents were maybe not on the same page with that um, or the producer themselves. So uh, next thing that we always look to uh, implement into our risk management strategy for our swine producers is a loss of farm income, and that's yardage replacement. So in the event that uh, your barn has a partial loss or a total loss, this is what would respond to give you that yardage income. Uh, you'll want to be watchful for that. Uh, again, from company to company, there's limitations, there's time limitations. Uh, so we commonly see a, a six month time frame, and, and that typically from what we see is, is an adequate amount of time and a partial loss to get you up and going. So, but Colin touched about cash is king in the event of a loss. And, uh, you know, what are we going to do? Well, this is your, one of your very first lines of defense as a custom grower. For a more sophisticated operation, more moving parts, and we'll get into uh, uh, business income, uh, business interruption type coverages. So that can provide you your ongoing payroll, your utilities, uh, different things of that nature, your fixed expenses to get you through that loss. Uh, with the sophistication of today's uh, farm operations and with uh, all the involvement from the tax world and the law world, inevitably you're going to end up with several different corporations. Uh, make sure that you guys have those listed on your policy. You know, so I'll have my, na my uh, named insured for my policy would be Marty Pippet. But if I have a barn and it's under Marty Pippet Barn, LLC, then I want to make sure that I've got that listed. And that's going to respond in two fashions. One, for the insurable interest of your property, but also for the insurable interest in a liability situation. Really important for you guys to have that listed properly. Uh, we get into pollution. Pollution uh, has a lot of different moving parts. Make sure you sit down and talk to your, to your agent about the the exposures that you have. You know, if you're getting into four higher, so if you're doing any custom manure application, that's going to change everything on your policy. Make sure that you've got that put together properly. And uh, if you get into, you got uh, tankers and you're doing any hauling that way, uh, any commercial auto or business auto policy is going to have a commercial exclusion and your uh, pollution exclusion, and you're going to want to put some endorsements on there to give you that uh, coverage in the event of an accident that would inevitably be over a body of water or near a body of water, which would inevitably be uh, affected. So uh, farm pollution, if you guys have any uh, honey, honey wagons or any tankers uh, running up and down the road farm to farm, same, same topic there. Uh, most farm policies are going to come with uh, some coverage, Make sure it's adequate. That varies from company to company as well. Um, we get into a very specific type of coverage uh, for ASF. So again, as I touched on before, our agency, we work exclusively with, with growers, uh, with farmers. And uh, through this last year and ASF presenting itself as such a crippling uh, and, and potential devastation uh, for, for our business and then the guys that we work with, we took it upon ourselves to go out and uh, beat the streets and figure out a way to get this covered for guys. So uh, with ASF insurance, uh, it's important to note that your, your common farm policy, by and large, disease and sickness, that's excluded. So don't, don't necessarily rely on your current farm policy to provide you anything in that situation. Again, talk to your agent. Make sure that uh, company to company, that can vary. But by and large, that's what you will experience. So, so for you as growers, how do you manage that risk? There's things that you can control, and there's things that you can't control. So biosecurity, can you ramp up your efforts in that? I'm sure you guys have been in different breakout sessions, and you've realized the importance of that. And that's certainly come to light. Um, you know, your secure, uh, pork supply plans, you know, getting something in, in order for that. Those uh, are great things to be doing. Again, those are things you can control, but what you can't control maybe is what the neighbor up the road is doing. And as we'll talk about with some of the USDA zones and how ASF will impact you, could impact you, um, it becomes very evident very quick of what you can't control can, can uh, very quickly uh, adversely affect you. So, 
Another way to manage that risk is what we're gonna talk about right now would be uh, taking out an insurance policy on that. So if you're a custom grower, the policy that we have is uh, what you would apply for is coverage for the income replacement, so your yardage replacement. <clears throat> you can purchase coverage for disinfection and for the disposal and the removal. Um, I'm not sure if anybody has uh, participated or, or listened in on any of the ASF exercises uh, or any of the other classes. ASF is very, very situational in, in regards to how things are going to respond. Um, the initial conversations with the USDA was that the USDA is going to be participating in um, the cost and um, more than likely picking up the portion of the loss, which would be the disinfection, cleaning, and removal, the disposal. But um, again, that's a fluid conversation that seems to uh, change uh, as this thing goes on. So the policy that we're going to talk about for ASF, it's a 12-month policy. So if you were to apply for that coverage, it's, a, it's an annual policy, and then it has a 12-month indemnity period. So if you were 11 months through your policy, if you took that out on January 1st of 2020, and at the end of November of 2020, there was an outbreak and you had the policy in place, then you would have 11 months of an indemnity period. Uh, there is a two week uh, moratorium or a waiting period at the beginning of the policy. And uh, that's to police uh, for any of those folks that are sitting on the sidelines and saying, I'll wait till it gets real. Uh, so if you uh, were to take the coverage and, and uh, within the first two weeks you were affected, uh, you, there would be no return premium, but there would also um, be no loss that would be paid, paid to you. So f for the custom growers, again, just your yardage replacement. That business income piece that we talked about earlier, that's what this is for ASF. Uh, if you own hogs, uh, we can uh, put coverage in place on this, and it would be for the fixed and ongoing expenses. You know, your, your typical payroll, taxes, insurance, utilities, um, on the mortality side of things, in the event of an outbreak, there's an act that is, uh, that's out there. It's called the Animal Health Protection Act. And how that reads is that it, in an ASF outbreak, uh, the USDA would pay for 50% of the market value of those hogs. Well, the X factor of that would be, where's the market at? What is the value of your, of your hogs? And, um, in the event of an outbreak, if the Secretary of Agriculture were to declare an extraordinary emergency circumstance, then they would pay 100% of the value of the hog. But again, you know, like when we work with integrators and they're talking about repopping and uh, the value of those hogs, um, you know, we can hedge that bet. We can say, well, I think it's worth X and uh, the government might pay Y, so I'm going to take out the balance of, of coverage on the mortality side. Again, this is a 12-month policy, a uh, two-week moratorium at the beginning of that. <clears throat> How does the, uh, the policy, what are the mechanics of it? How does it work? Uh, coverage triggers upon the USDA or an equivalent government body declaring ASF at your premise. So that would be your operation being declared as a designated or infected premise. It also triggers is if you are a suspect premise, and we'll go and I'll show you here in just a moment the zones and how the USDA will identify that. So you're gonna be ground zero, or in essence about a two mile um, circle around that would be the euthanization zone. And, uh, and then there's approximately a four mile area outside of that, which would be the quarantine zone. So if you were in you know, ground zero, if you were in that two mile, uh, the quarantine area, the four mile, then this would provide coverage. If you were a contact premise, so if the sow unit that provides your flow, if that was hit with ASF, and they're no longer capable of providing you the flow to your, to your barn, then um, the contact premise, that side of it, would also respond for, for coverage. <clears throat> so if there's a lack of supply, again, if we can identify the the flow, so if we can say, hey, my finisher, my nursery is, is uh, always getting hogs from this and this sow unit, then we can 
attach that piece of the coverage. If you're unable to, you know, some of the systems out there, uh, they're not sure exactly where their flow is coming from, then we omit that side of, of, the, of the coverage. <clears throat> At, uh, in the exercises, if any of you guys have listened in on that, in the event of an outbreak, there's going to be a movement standstill or a movement restriction uh, order. So state to state, I believe now, as, as it's been decided, there'll be a grace period where they're going to give you 6, 8, 12 hours for anything that's on the road to get to, uh, to its place. And uh, after that, everything is shut down. So from feed to semen, uh, to hogs, I mean, anything swine related, they're parking it. And the reasoning for that is that they're going to do their trace back investigations. They're going to try to figure out the origin, where it's at, and so they can stamp it out and, and stop it. So if your premise is placed within a movement restriction order, that would be another triggering component of this policy for coverage. Uh, this is that illustration. Uh, as you can see, the X would indicate uh, what the USDA is calling the infected premise. And then uh, that, that uh, pink, reddish area there, that would be the, the euthanization zone. So if you know, we're talking about things that you can control and things that you can't control, you can have the best of biosecurity on your place, but what, what are the guys within two miles of you doing? And then what are the guys in the next four miles doing? Because those six mile circles start dropping around the countryside, it gobbles it up pretty quick. So. Um, that's the infected premise. Then you've got the, quor the quarantine is in the blue. And uh, as, it, as it's been uh, discussed at the functional exercises, the movement restriction orders will allow permitting to go in and out after they've uh, figured out uh, when they're comfortable with what's going on and they feel like they've got a good handle on that. So those, those permits and that movement restriction, if that does affect you, though, that's going to be part of this, this policy. <clears throat> how do you get paid? We talked about how the mechanics work and what it takes to trigger coverage. Uh, you're going to have that 12-month indemnity. So if you're a 2,000-head barn and you're 40 bucks a space, you got uh, $80,000, and you are paid that on a pro rata on a monthly basis, this policy is just going to come in and pay you just as you were getting paid. Um, if you are on the fixed expenses side, as you incur those losses, and, and inevitably you're going to have some expenses that are far greater at the inception of that loss or at the beginning of that loss, this policy will pay for those losses up to the amount of what you apply for. <clears throat> and with that, um, I think we'll, we'll hand it over here, and uh, we'll let Chris go through things, and then we'll ask uh, some questions and whatnot with that later. Like Colin said, my name's Chris. I am a PhD student in economics at Iowa State University. I work with Lee Schultz, the livestock extension econ economist at Iowa State. With that, we're just going to launch right into uh, the, the topic of discussion today. Um, so I'm not going to belabor. Um, labor the the situation with ASF. The the whole session next door um, spent spent half the time uh, talking about exactly what this slide is talking about. Basically, ASF was reported for the first time in August 2018 in China. Since then, it has gone everywhere. You can see in this picture here that it's all over the country, um, and China is a big country. And hog inventory of the country has dropped at least 40% by official estimates. Um, one of the presenters next door said uh, their sort of internal estimates are 60 to 70%. So it's a big deal. Um, a natural question that like an economist might ask, and you know, many, many of you in this room are probably asking too, is how have US ag markets responded to this sort of event in the international uh, supply and demand of pork. Um, and in particular, I'm going to talk about the lean hog futures market and the lean hog options market today. So you can see here in this picture, this is just a, a plot of the 2019 lean hog uh, futures contract uh, for, um, for June 19, like I said. Um, I want to point out two particular features of this. You can see there's that... Um, 
oh, uh, about, I don't know, about a quarter of the way in, there's a, there's a big increase there. That is uh, in response to the announcement of the outbreak. You can see it's a, the low point there in the graph, about $70 is about August 1st when right around that time ASF was announced for the first time. And you can see in a period of about three weeks, uh, the futures contract, the price rose $10 a hundred weight. So that's a big response. Uh, the other feature of this graph I want to point out is you can see in spring of 19, toward the right side of the graph there, uh, futures price goes from about $75 a hundred weight to a hundred bucks. In, in about a month, about six weeks. So that's a huge market response in the, in the futures market. Um, and uh, almost certainly a result of African swine fever, ASF in China. Uh, a related graph, this is the implied volatility from the options market uh, for the same contract during the same time period. Uh, you can see spikes in the same two places I pointed out before, August of 18 when it was announced, and then spring of 19. This is just a measure of variability in the market. Um, and you can see that prices have become way more volatile uh, by this measure. Uh, the volatility went from uh, under you know 20% before the outbreak was announced to 45% in spring of 2019. So prices have become way more variable. So what exactly was going on in spring of 19 when, when that, you know, the price went through the roof and so did the variability? Well, on March 14th, USDA announced that China purchased uh, 24,000 metric tons or 50 million pounds of pork from the US in the week ending March 7th. Despite, uh, despite steep tariffs. Um, so that, that was a big market event. Um, also in uh, the day later, that was a Thursday, Friday, March 15th, US Customs announced that it seized a million pounds of illegally imported food products from China. That was initially reported as sort of like pork products, later was revised to be food products. Um, but those two things are probably what's driving the sort of market response that we saw on those graphs. So the question is, um, what do these responses that we've seen um, tell us about the probability that ASF comes to the United States? This is sort of like a 30,000 foot view. Um, I think it was Marty who said that ASF in the United States uh, would be very situational. Um, it depends on a lot of different things, what exactly the, the outbreak would look like and what exactly the response by, by stakeholders up and down um, the supply chain would look like. So this is sort of um, an attempt to market or to calculate the market perceived probability of an outbreak that tries to uh, free itself of those sorts of specificities and just gets a sort of an economist's um, view of it. So just some, show you the data I've been working with real quickly. This is just sort of a rolling uh, year out lean hog futures contract. Each of these prices you see here is a, a futures price that is like corresponds with um, a contract that is roughly a year out from the nearby contract. You can see regular seasonality, pr prices are lower in November and December, higher in the summer. Not, not much uh, unusual there. But this is where things start to get interesting. This is that same measure of variability I showed you before, but now this is the sort of the rolling version of that, of that um, variability. You can see that prior to 2014, it was below or at 15%. Um, there's it increases to about 20% for about three or four years there. And then all of a sudden in August of 18, there is this huge jump from under 20% to above 25%. And then again in spring of 19, there is an increase from about 25% to above 45. So these huge increases in variability. And so what do I do? I take those two graphs that you've seen, the data from those graphs, and I simulate uh, prices for every single day 
um, from November of 16 until, I guess, November of 19 is how far I've gone so far. And I calculate for each day what percentage of those prices fall below a certain uh, price threshold. So I have three price thresholds listed here. Uh, the, the blue line is the $50 100 weight price threshold. You can see that there's some seasonality that comes in there. There's a higher likelihood you see in, um, in December that we hit $50 100 weight in the futures market than there is in June. Um, on the flip side, there's a $30 100 weight. So what proportion of simulated prices fall below $30? That's essentially zero all the way through, almost indistinguishable from the, from the horizontal x-axis. In between is the orange line, um, and that is the $40 100 weight uh, sort of threshold. And I'm going to uh, zoom in on that here quick. So the perceived probability of an ASF outbreak or catastrophic disease outbreak or meaningful market event that causes prices to hit $40, however you want to couch it, uh, March 1st was about a percent. Um, Two weeks later, March 15th, 19th, so after those back-to-back -back announcements, had jumped to, to nearly 2.5%. Two weeks later, uh, the market predicted probability of that had gone up a 4% and then had moderated to about 25 again by April 15th. Um, and I looked right before I, uh, the session started. My most recent calculation is for November 22nd. And on November 22nd, the market uh, perceived probability of an outbreak according to this measure was 3.4%. So more than three times what we saw on March 1st. And so like in summary, the, the model, the ASF outbreak pop probability increased substantially um, in response to this news regarding ASF outbreaks in China. And this is a big deal. Um, in particular, because of you know, all the discussions that happen next door, the discussions we've had today have been you know, um, if ASF happens, how do you how do you dispose of the animals? If ASF happens, how do um, how does that impact the contracts that you that you have? If ASF happens, um, are you going to want to have an insurance policy in, in place? And those are all very important discussions. Um, and but like a natural question is, so how likely is this event actually to take place? And the answer is that that's way more likely than it was before by a 200% increase. Um, a uh, just I, I want to give a brief um, sort of practical application or some implications of this research. Um, but first, I'm going to qualify. I am not a risk management expert. Uh, we started out, you know getting to know each other, saying that it's not what you know, but who you know. I know Lee Schultz, and he is a risk management expert. So he and I uh, sat down and put together a little example here, some cowboy math, hopefully just kind of uh, demonstrate what's going on. So a question that we've gotten is, uh, what is the viability of using uh, the options market to manage disease outbreak related risk in the United States. Um, and I, you can see these, I li listed these same four dates here that we saw when we were um, looking at the probability of an outbreak. You can see during that time of the June 19 lean hog futures contract, uh, the price went up more than 20 bucks. Um, listed next to that is the premium for a $10, you know, 100 weight out of the money put option. Um, and uh, you can see that the price for that 10, the premium for that $10 out of the money put option more than doubled in six weeks. Now, what's kind of interesting about that is that during that time period, you'd actually expect that put option to get cheaper. Um, but because of the increased variability in prices over, over that period, uh, the, the premium actually more than doubled. On the flip side, if you were to maintain that six, same $66 uh, 100 weight put option that you know was $10 out of the money on March 1st, the price for that sort of like catastrophic loss put option uh, went from, you know, a buck 100 weight there to 15 cents. So, you know, the question, and then I'm just going to translate this into dollar a pig quick. Um, on March 1st, the price for that put option was $2 a pig. 
but by April 15th, 2019, that was 30 cents a pig. So, you know, the, to the question, um, in answer to the question of what has happened to the viability of using put options uh, to manage this type of risk, has it gotten more expensive? Has it gotten more cheap? Has it gotten cheaper? Um, the answer is it depends. If you're trying to protect ten dollar out of the hunt, uh, out of the money, um, if that's what you're trying to do, the the premiums have gone up um, substantially. But if you're just trying to cover catastrophic loss, in this particular instance, uh, the the premiums went down. Now, granted, this is um, this was a contract that expired, you know, two or three months after these particular dates. Um, there are all sorts of qualifications. Like I said, this is cowboy math, um, but this is a very, uh, very simple demonstration of um, what has happened in risk management um, in the wake of ASF in China. So, um, thank you, and I think now we'll start the Q and A. So, questions? Any, any, any for any three of these, or if you just got a broad question, we'll try to direct it to, to them. Um, Dave, go ahead. Yeah, my question is for Marty. The uh, insurance for a contract keeper sounds pretty viable. Uh, however, as a pig owner, you talk about paying the uh, price of the market value of the animal. So the government might cover half of it, and then the insurance would cover the other half. Uh, unlike China, we are not a net importer of pork. We live on exports, and if we were to get this disease, our exports would be shut off. So all that 25% or more of pork that we export would have to stay in the country, therefore shoving our prices very low, in my opinion. And so what would you figure as the price? Would you say, okay, now the price is 10 cents a hundredweight because we have ASF, so you're getting your 10 cents? or would you say, oh, well, the day before it broke, uh, prices were 75 cents, and you're getting that 75 cents. So, I mean, uh, what the value of the pig at the time is going to be greatly diminished if we have an outbreak because we can't sell anything outside the United States. You bet. Good question. So within that, the discussions that we've had with growers, with integrators, with folks that are looking at that portion of the coverage, it's a conversation. We just talk it through. How much do you want to rely on that potential indemnity from the government? And then what opportunity may I have if cash is king and I'm able to repop when the market maybe is high? I mean, how important, how many dollars do you want to put in play coverage wise to repop? And, you know, I don't know that that's a one size fit all, you know, type of answer. But it's a conversation that we would go through and just look at the moving parts of it and, uh, and figure that through. So I don't know there's a great black and white answer to that. I will mention, Marty, you've got a booth upstairs if folks want to visit with you further on particular insurance questions. So be one thing. And the others will hang around afterwards as well. So another question? Anything? Surely there's concerns. Obviously, it's, I'm, I'm glad you're here because I know in visiting extension, we work a lot in the area of biosecurity in this last year, you know, and just, just upping your game. And if we can get ahead of these disaster preparedness, whether it's biosecurity from a disease standpoint or whether it's just EMS planning, I know some of that can keep particularly an owner or anybody that's got barn payments awake at night. And so... I hope that you can take some of the, the experiences that they've shared from you and, and do some action on it. Get some EMS plans together, communicate with the rest of your team, your insurance carrier, your pig suppliers. Um, lenders need to be involved in this conversation as well, very dramatically uh, about this thing. So, But you know, beyond prayer, which is very much needed in this situation, uh, there are some, some steps you can take. And so any of these guys are, are able to help you troubleshooting that area extension, uh, we're available as well. So. More questions? Colin, I actually, uh, yeah. I'll add on Go a couple on. of things here, conversations that I've had that you know, kind of just um, led me to remember a thing or two here. So one thing I would very much recommend to you guys is have the discussion with your integrator, for those of you that are contract growers, hey, what is going to happen? How will this play out? Will my yardage be in place? 
what's my contract read? Uh, be attentive to that force majeure. If you look at uh, the components and the, the ability for that to come into play, that certainly is. Um, it, it, it definitely seems to vary, you know, from, from uh, integrator to integrator on, on intent, you know, with that. Um, but definitely have that conversation, you know, and that can be part of the decision-making process. And then another thing, too, on the, on the care custody control side of things, make sure, I know this is a, a common mishap, if you will, is that if you're, if you're custom feeding and you're in the operations day-to-day, -day, your chore in your barns, that coverage uh, is, is pretty black and white in regards to that. But now if you've got folks that are working for you, if you've got employees, then, then that changes the dynamic. So make sure you sit down with your agent and you just have that real open dialogue of this is my operation. This is what I've got going on out at the farm so that in the event of uh, something going south, that this thing responds, the coverage that you have responds in a fashion that, that you need it to. Yeah, you, you bring up a good point, Marty. It, it's amazing to think about all the people I mean, the livelihoods that touch a farm, right, that generate income from it and the turnover, especially if you think uh, about a, a breed to finish and, and the sow activities and so forth, and even just, uh, you know, the custom finishing, all that's involved with the financing and the inputs there. There's a lot of jobs, a lot of people relying on this, so it's not just impacting you as the owner of pigs and, and the revenue there or the revenue from a barn ownership standpoint. There's a lot to be prepared for in, in just business continuity, right, in the, in the light of a disaster and, and even animal well-being that's involved with the situation, say an external situation that comes in and, and creates a disaster. You mentioned a tornado or a fire uh, condition and communicating with uh, your local EMS, your local farm, your own farm team what to do and, and respond to these situations. And then obviously, yes, the family incomes that are derived from it too. So. Um, it's great to see the, the young faces in here, and, and it's great to know that uh, you're looking forward to investing and, and being involved with uh, the Iowa pork industry and know that it's in good hands, but uh, there's a, a lot at stake and a lot to be involved with, so I'm glad you're here uh, gaining a little bit of knowledge in this topic. So, anything else for remaining questions? Yes, in the back. There, there's, there's a quick speaker box coming to you here. It just, it's a microphone. So. Um, for Matt. Um, the force majeure, if mm -hmm. we know ASF uh, is out there at now and things aren't being done, steps aren't taken to protect contractors by an integrator um, and they get it, is, is force majeure still uh, going to be applicable? And then for Marty, does this insurance cover acts of terrorism? Mm. Very good. So uh, first on the force majeure, uh, the answer is it depends on the language of the contract and how that is defined as the force majeure event. So one of, one of the key factors for it is um, whether it's preventable. Now with, with a, a foreign animal disease outbreak, uh, I'm going to assume that nobody's intentionally uh, introducing it, so it's not going to be preventable. It's going to be that kind of an event. Um, foreseeability is one factor if the contract is vague as far as the force majeure events. So if you had a, a general term act of God, uh, that becomes, whether something falls within that definition um, depends on how foreseeable it was when the contract was drafted. The more foreseeable it was, the more a court is likely to say it should have been identified. So that, that varies a little bit. Uh, but most of the, the clauses don't just say act of God. They'll say in the event of a fire, uh, weather event, uh, et cetera. So you want to look at that list. Uh, some contracts will say a disease outbreak. Uh, some won't. Uh, many of them will say a, uh, in the event of a government order, uh, which would be particularly applicable to a foreign animal disease outbreak. Um, because you need to look beyond the outbreak itself to what we uh, expect the government response to be in response to it. So if there was a, a situation where a government ordered the sow farm that was the supplier of a contract to be depopulated and that prevented performance, that could still be covered. So 
there's no black and white answer other than it depends on what the actual contract says for those events. Marty. That um, answer, yeah, there. <laughs> All right. Uh, the, your question in regards to terrorism, and specifically in this example, we'd be talking about bioterrorism. That is a standard exclusion, and it is on this policy as well. Um, we've had long in-depth conversations with the company, with the carrier, with the underwriters. You know, what if that bioterrorism is introduced in one side of the country and then I'm not affected until a year later? Does it stem back to that and that? There's so much, again, ASF that's situational. Um, I'll, I'll go with the fact that the policy has that standard exclusion, but I don't believe that they're going to stem it back to, you know, one person coming over with a, uh, a package of you know, tainted virus and sausage, you know, so, yeah. Got another question in the front. Out of, out of curiosity for Matt, how did the uh, fine that the uh, elevator or the anhydrous leak was uh, notified about, how did that come out since they uh, did start locally and just uh, because there was not anything actively leaking out at the time the way you described it, uh, there really was not a large pollution uh, event or at least not a, a noted one, was there? Uh, so there was. So it was, was. the... the in entire um, tank of anhydrous was released into the air um, was the conclusion because it wasn't in the fire extinguisher and it wasn't anywhere else. Uh, so there was a release into the air of the anhydrous ammonia that was above the reported reporting threshold for the release. Uh, I can't get into specifics, uh, but uh, there was a penalty from the EPA that was negotiated and paid. But there was no injury to, no human injury. No, thankfully there was no human injury.